The following podcast is a presentation of This is Infamous. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 26, to be perfectly precise. I'm your host, Billy Donnelly, who you can find at JoeBlow.com. This is Infamous, and right here at Just the Worst Podcast. And as we do every single week, talk wrestling, professional wrestling, sports entertainment, whatever you want to call it. Sometimes... We bring in some people in the industry to discuss what's going on, their experiences and whatnot. Other times, bring in some of my colleagues and sort of get a fresh perspective on how they're viewing some of the happenings in the world of professional wrestling. This week, neither of those are going to happen. It is my show, so I can sort of do whatever I want and fly by the seat of my pants. And so as a result, this week, I thought it might be prudent to sort of just sit down by myself and talk to you, talk with you, for this particular show. And look at what's going on in the WWE right now as we head on towards the road to WrestleMania. Uh, in particular, Roadblock, the WWE Network special coming up this particular weekend. You know, as well as some of the other announcements, uh, big announcements surrounding the WWE that came up this week regarding next year's WrestleMania, WrestleMania 33. Also going to talk a little bit about TNA this week. And some Lucha Underground as well. Uh, and, and, of course, we'll get into the WWE and what happened this week on Raw. Uh, once again, as we head towards WrestleMania 32 in Dallas. But I, I guess the most logical place to start this week was regarding the big announcement by the WWE uh, in Florida. My home state now of Florida. That WrestleMania 33 next year would be returning to Orlando to the renovated Citrus Bowl for the first time since WrestleMania 24, which was headlined by Edge and The Undertaker, and also most notably uh, Ric Flair's retirement match against the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. This would be the first time that they'd returned now back to Orlando since then, so uh, nearly a decade. Um, but as we all know, the WWE has a, a pretty big setup going on in the Orlando area. Uh, the WWE Performance Center set up in Orlando. Uh, NXT tapes at Full Sail University in Orlando. A lot of the WWE talent lives in Central Florida. So whether it's Orlando, the Orlando suburbs, even a little bit further west towards Tampa, which is only about an hour away, um, it, it's nice for WWE talent, for their superstars, for their divas, to sort of come home and be able to work in that level of comfort, I guess, for their big show of the year. Now, I had been in WrestleMania. WrestleMania 24 was actually my second WrestleMania following my experience in New York City in Madison Square Garden for WrestleMania 20. Uh, so beyond that, WrestleMania 24 was uh, my second WrestleMania, which would now be coming up on my fifth, I believe, this year, having also gone to uh, 28, 30, and uh, 31. Actually, it'll be my sixth WrestleMania this year. So, look, um, the thing about the uh, the arena, or actually the stadium in Orlando, and at that point, even access in, around WrestleMania 24 wasn't as big as it used to be. But there is... Um, uh, while, I, while I will say that Orlando does not necessarily have sort of the central areas that I think and there are look there are some some tourist areas that are, are great for people coming into Orlando and there's a lot of things to do in Orlando besides just wrestling so I think in that respect it's also kind of cool because while there's usually lots of just wrestling centric events and activities going on WrestleMania weekend, there is a lot for you to get out of Orlando to sort of get your money's worth if you're going to travel in 
and attend WrestleMania 33 next week. I mean, Disney World is there with their four parks. Uh, Universal Studios is there with their two parks. Busch Gardens is only about an hour away. Uh, There's a lot to do in Orlando outside of just wrestling that I think if you were to save up your money and make the trip next year for WrestleMania 33 in Orlando, it'd be pretty cool. But outside of that, the stadium there... The Central Ball is a little bit of an older stadium. They have re they have revamped it and renovated it some, as I believe that is the uh, the home field of the Orlando City, their new uh, local professional soccer team that draws a pretty solid crowd out there. So as a result, they've they've re upped uh, a bit of the the stadium in, to make it a much more attractive venue. But on top of that. It's a, it's a really it's it's old school in that, um, even if you're sort of further up, it's 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 not that far away. I believe when we attended WrestleMania 24, we were sort of in the 300 level, sort of dead center uh, to the ring, and it didn't feel that far away. Still a great view, even if you're upstairs, uh, since it is only a, a two tiered. Um, arena really uh, actually the middle is sort of just an extension of, of the first here so it, it, it doesn't go that high it's not like if you were going to um, Levi's Field out in San Jose last year which was incredibly high um, even Dallas this year which will be incredibly high uh, it's there's, there's really not a bad seat in the house when you go to the Citrus Bowl. So I think WrestleMania 33 being in Orlando is a really, really cool place for them to go. They had a really good experience there the last time. And I think there's there's plenty going on uh, in and around Orlando for fans to feel like they're going to get their money's worth. Unlike sort of last year out in San Jose where there wasn't really a lot to do in San Jose, Orlando. There is tons to do. Uh, you can make a whole week out of going to Orlando uh, if you have the money and the time to be able to set up to go to, to WrestleMania 33. So, prior to that, it had been rumored that I believe Target Field, the uh, the new stadium that, uh, that was in Minnesota, was going to be sort of the front runner. And I believe that wound up falling apart sort of deep into the process, which is why we haven't gotten an announcement on WrestleMania 33 until now. Usually it's a little bit earlier in the process that we get the venue for the following year. So with Minnesota falling through, I think not that the WWE was scrambling, uh, Orlando ever since WrestleMania 24, has been really making a major push to get sort of in the rotation um, and, and and get WrestleMania back into Central Florida. Uh, but I think they were a, a convenient choice that had also been sort of just leaning on the WWE, sort of always whispering, always there, always letting their... Uh, enthusiasm and excitement and willingness to bring WrestleMania back be known. And when Minnesota ultimately didn't come to pass, it didn't take too long or look too far in either direction for the WWE to say, oh, hey, Orlando, you're there. So, uh, So in that respect, I think it's very, very cool. For WrestleMania 33 to be in Orlando, I most certainly will be there, considering it's only about a two and a half hour ride north of me. Um, so uh, while I will be there this year uh, in Dallas, although plans seem to have changed as far as what what I'm going to be doing and accomplishing in Dallas, uh, I will still be in Dallas for WrestleMania 33, and you can bet your sweet ass I will be in Orlando next year for WrestleMania 33 um, and, and how that shapes up. So what we're talking about is Access is going to be, I believe, in the Orlando County Convention Center, which is a massive convention center in uh, on International Drive, which is sort of right in the heart of Orlando. So at while at times now it seems like access can feel a little crowded, a little crammed, I would hope 
that the WWE really steps up next year in order to make the most out of the venue because um, in recent years, with the exception of maybe New Orleans, um, I don't believe that they have had any location any convention center location really the size of what they have on their hands um, in Orlando. So I would hope that Access would really take it up a notch beyond where they've been in the past. And beyond that, you know, you're going to have Raw on, on Monday night at the Amway Center, which is where the Royal Rumble is this year, as well as the Hall of Fame there as well. And grand, given the crowd we sort of got in Orlando for the Royal Rumble, I am really psyched about what that crowd may be for WrestleMania and for Raw and the Hall of Fame if they can get a really big local contingent there. Uh, I think it's going to be really cool because it is a vocal audience. It is also an audience that is much smarter than you would give credit to your typical Florida audience is. uh, Having seen WWE shows up and down the state, the one in Orlando tends to really be emphatic and hardcore. So especially given sort of um, what we've come to see with NXT in the area. Although uh, I will say having... Seen NXT shows both in Full Sail University and outside of Full Sail University in the Orlando area. Uh, when they did tape at the University of Central Florida, eh, not quite as uh, vocal and enthusiastic as we've seen uh, NXT shows in the past. So I, I think, look, I, I think the Orlando market is a really good market for, for the WWE to come in and do another WrestleMania. I'm really excited about WrestleMania 33 taking place in Orlando. I'm super excited about going there because now I can just not fly or pay for uh, (laughs) hotel accommodations. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on there uh, as far as uh, WrestleMania is concerned. And uh, the, the one other thing that sort of is a wild card, but I'm sure we'll know a little bit further down the line, is what they would do with an NXT show. Obviously, for WrestleMania weekend, can't just do something in full sale. Uh, just, just way too small of a venue. Do they do UCF? Do they stay with the Amway Center? I don't know. There's a lot of a uh, lot of different things that they could possibly do for an NXT takeover over WrestleMania weekend. So that's one of the wild cards. But I think um, they'll get a really strong contingent coming into Orlando. And on top of that, there's now also rumors and the possibility of them having a standing WWE Hall of Fame. Uh, The rumors have been circulating for a while, and it looks like they're moving in that way. They haven't announced anything when they had the uh, WrestleMania 33 press conference, but... Here's what I will tell you I have heard. I have heard that because, especially because, the WWE is such a vital part of NBC Universal, who owns the USA Network and, and whatnot, that they have really been pushing to try and make a match happen with the WWE and give them a presence to potentially have their WWE Hall of Fame. Uh, Now, what I am hearing, and I've heard this from a couple of different sources, is that the WWE Hall of Fame will be opening a restaurant slash interactive location slash Hall of Fame, physical standing Hall of Fame, at Universal, on the Universal property. Once again, going back to the NBC Universal sort of marriage, the synergy there. Uh, on the grounds of Universal City Walk, it would be taking over the location uh, that used to be inhabited by NBA City and would essentially sit right on the water there, um, the lagoon of sorts, as another dining slash entertainment venue for guests to be able to visit. Now, there's recently been opened... uh, There was a NASCAR cafe that shut down that's now been rebranded as a NBC Sports Grill. Uh, The Hard Rock Cafe slash Hard Rock Live venue is there. Um, So so it, it would fit in. It's just a matter of, are they going to be able to generate the traffic 
into the location regularly to make it work. NBA City had it for a while and then sort of died out. The NASCAR place had it for a while and sort of died out because once again you're talking about venues that are specifically geared towards a particular fan base that are geared towards NASCAR fans or NBA fans. The the NBC Sports Grill, that's for a little bit of everything, I guess. You can go watch, you know, MMA fighting there, you watch boxing, you watch football, you watch basketball, you watch whatever basically is on TV, the big sports moment at the time. When it comes to going to the WWE Hall of Fame uh, or, or whatever it is that they're going to call this venue, what they're, they're going to call this location, um, you're really not going to want to go there unless you're a WWE fan. So while the WWE's global reach is massive, if you're going to Universal Studios and you're talking about Universal's pretty aggressive expansion, whether it's Harry Potter or what they're doing with King Kong or, or Fast and Furious or all the other number of attractions that are there, and you're spending a great deal of money there inside those parks, are you then also going to be coming out and spending uh, above average price to get a meal in the Hall of Fame? Or can you just go toward the Hall of Fame? Is it going to be set up like that as far as a, a legitimate Hall of Fame? Or is it going to be similar to what they had with the, the World Restaurant in Times Square years ago that they just never could quite get right? Um, where you sort of walk around, it's very almost like Hard Rock Cafe-ish where you walk around and you can see different memorabilia on display, but it's not necessarily set up in a Hall of Fame way like, you know, an NFL Hall of Fame, Pro Football Hall of Fame, or baseball, Major League Baseball Hall of Fame, like any of those would be. So I think there is some possibility there. It's going to be a matter of how you attract not WWE fans into the venue to make it work, but... NBC Universal is, interestingly enough, willing to go forth with this and and give them a prime location to try and make it work in the hopes of making it work. Now, one of the problems they had in Times Square was just it's in the heart of New York City. There's just a lot of other options, better options, especially if you're not a WWE fan. Inside Universal CityWalk, I think that also exists. Other options if you're not a WWE fan. So we'll see if they can sort of make that marriage work, make the concept work um, in order to get paying customers regularly visiting in order to justify the investment. So uh, some, some really cool and exciting things that clearly uh, on the w going on for the WWE right now as they plan for next year. Uh, but let's talk about what they're doing for this year as they head towards WrestleMania 32 in Dallas. Trying to get clearly 100,000 plus fans into that stadium. Hoping to set a new record beyond what they set in the Pontiac Silverdome for WrestleMania 3. And I don't know that they have the juice to do it this year. I know they would like to, but the way that you sort of set the world on fire in order to get that many people in one location to watch a show is to have something that's white hot that people absolutely cannot turn away from, that they feel absolutely 110% compelled to tune into and watch. And I don't know, heading into WrestleMania 32, that they've been able to do it. It's not just a matter of the injury bug that has really, really affected the roster for the past few months. But also the fact that the booking of their product has not really made, or created, or supported any must-see stars that people 
just have to tune in and watch. And, you know, I don't know that they've had many of those figures in recent years. You know, The Rock coming back for WrestleMania 28 in his hometown of Miami was maybe about as close of a major attraction as they've possibly had in recent years. Otherwise, you got to really go back towards, you know, Mike Tyson in WrestleMania 14 just being a part. Or even, I mean, even the mainstream attention they've got, they got when Lawrence Taylor wrestled Bam Bam Bigelow. I mean, that maybe, but even then, it's, I don't know that Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow is what you could help try and fill hundred something thousand people in the stadium on. So you need something there that's really hooking people. And I'm not just talking about the people who tune in out of curiosity. I mean the fact that you have expanded your fan base so largely with your product that the numbers of people who are going out of their way to watch this are just so incredible. Either the go there is so incredible, or to watch on TV is so incredible. And I don't know that they have it. Now look, I'm not putting down WrestleMania 32 right now. I think they, they are assembling a much better card than you could have anticipated back in even December. I think... You look at some of the matches that they're starting to put together and you say to yourself, hmm, that could be pretty good. And look, in recent years, that's sort of been the WWE's MO, is to really set the bar low, given what their programming has been, and then come out and deliver at WrestleMania with a pretty satisfying show that fans look at and they say, hmm, all right, I feel like you got my money's worth. But in order to get 100,000 plus people inside Cowboys Stadium or, or AT&T Stadium or whatever the hell it is they call that place, you have to have a product that is really at a peak point, not sort of where it is now. You need to have a product that has people tuning in on Monday nights in record numbers. You have to have people have a product that has people going out of their way to wear shirts that say, you know, D-Generation X or Austin 316. And I'm not saying that they need to go back to... Uh, Attitude Era style programming, but I am saying is that they need to figure out a way to recapture the enthusiasm that existed during the Attitude Era. They need to figure out how to get teens and kids and adults and hardcore fans, and casual fans, they need to figure out a way to get them all locked into what they're doing and excited about it, rather than what's going on right now. Because even going back to sort of the rock and wrestling era, WrestleMania 3 is the, is the one that they like to point at and say, this is where we set 93,000 people in the Silverdome for Hulk Hogan versus Andre the Giant. But at that point... Hulk Hogan versus the Andre the Giant was a marquee matchup that lots of people could get behind, that lots of people could get excited about. And not just people who were hardcore WWE fans at that point, but people who knew Hulk Hogan, people who had uh, uh, at least a semblance of who Andre the Giant was, maybe from when they were kids, and as a result, wanted to see the the major attraction that was there. So you look at what the WWE is putting together right now as they head towards WrestleMania 32, and you say, no, this could this has the potential to surprise us all. 
The matches that they're putting together have the potential to surprise us in quality and entertainment value. But, with that being said, you will also look to how they're getting to WrestleMania 32. And that's where sort of the head-scratching comes in. Because you say to yourself, they're not really doing anything to make me all that invested. On the day, on the night, I'll be excited when I see it unfold in front of me. But heading into those matches, heading into those cards, there's not a lot that you look at and say, Man, I really can't wait to see this particular issue resolved. I really can't wait to see this feud settled. I really can't wait to see these two individuals or these two teams or whatnot step into the ring to settle the score. There's not a lot of that. They're trying to get there sort of shorthandedly. But no real long game to give us something that we can sink our teeth into. And I'll give you a perfect example. You look at the main event. You look at the main event with Triple H defending the WWE World Heavyweight Championship against Roman Reigns. Now, Roman Reigns is not on television right now. Roman Reigns is out <clears throat> recovering from facial surgery to correct the damage done by Triple H in an attack on Raw. And sort of in order to quell the booze, the, the negativity surrounding Roman Reigns, they've elected to sort of remove him from the equation and put him on the shelf and allow Triple H's heelish tendencies, his actions, to stand out and allow Roman Reigns to perhaps return as the triumphant hero heading towards WrestleMania. Now the problem with that, and we've talked about this on the show before, is that then when you take Triple H and you line him up against Dean Ambrose... Roman Reigns' best friend. And a guy whose popularity trumps Roman Reigns. When Roman Reigns returns, how does that help Roman Reigns? Because right now, right now the fact that he is not around, he is forgotten. And this is a tactic that has happened within the WWE in recent memory where Roman Reigns being on the shelf did not make the did not the absence of Roman Reigns did not make people's hearts grow fond of him the absence of Roman Reigns allowed the WWE universe to shift their hatred of him Toward other personalities and talent that they just like more. Whether it was Dean Ambrose when he was white hot and feuding with Seth Rollins, whether it was Dolph Ziggler putting the authority out of power and single handedly winning a Survivor Series matchup on Team Cena a couple of years ago. It has allowed the fans to pivot to other areas where they are able to sort of fill in the void of Roman Reigns with, some, with a better option. So what do they do here is once again... They fill in, they plug the hole with Dean Ambrose, a guy that the WWE Universe just responds to better than Roman Reigns. They just do. They respond to him better, they cheer him louder. 
They're much more excited with his act. And they line Dean Ambrose up with a, for a match with Triple H at Roadblock, where he's been getting assaulted and sort of beaten down leading into that. And I don't know how they think on the other end things are going to come out okay. Because if things are supposed to hold true and stand firm, with Roadblock just sort of being a WWE special that doesn't really throw a wrench into the gears of what's happening for WrestleMania 32, then how do they think Dean Ambrose sort of just being an obstacle on the way is going to then help Roman Reigns when he returns. Because all that they're going to do is see a guy who once again is being cast aside when Roman Reigns conveniently shows back up. So you look at it and it just doesn't make any sense. Because it feels like they're giving the fans a taste of something that history has shown they'll just pull right back when they're, when the company's vision for how they should proceed is ready to happen again. I think they're walking on seriously dangerous ground right now. Unless they're looking at perhaps a heel turn by someone heading into WrestleMania, or a double turn, which is a possibility. But they're going to have to get creative because if they're just going to sort of stay the course with Roman Reigns coming back and defeating Triple H at WrestleMania and having his hero moment where he recaptures the WWE World Heavyweight Championship and Dean Ambrose isn't really a part of any of it, I think once again they're facing major backlash that to this point they've sort of just been ignoring. Now, is there a larger plan at Orc? Who knows? You go back last year to WrestleMania 31 with Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar in the main event. And I think people went into that match sort of assuming the worst. That Roman Reigns was just going to be handed the title, defeating Brock Lesnar, who fans had responded to once again. But the WWE managed to throw a nice wrinkle in there with Seth Rollins cashing in his money in the bank. And as a result, people, not that they felt surprised, but it also didn't necessarily feel inevitable. It wasn't something that was sort of laid out with ease for them to get a hold on. And we, we go to Raw this week and we have sort of a passionate Dean Ambrose promo in the middle of the show, which I thought was really solid. Felt like a character you would get behind, not a character reciting words that somebody had written for him. I think sort of the close of the show to build into Roadblock with Dean Ambrose sort of getting his one-up on Triple H after being beat down by the Wyatt family. Who then sort of teased the confrontation with Triple H. That that was... Not necessarily awkward, but it just seemed that there was a lot going on there. With elements they hadn't really done too much with. So I think... I mean, where, where are we going to go through with Roadblock? I don't know. They've been building this up for a few weeks now. But sort of moving from the Royal Rumble to WrestleMania and having two shows prominently promoted along the way, 
it sort of took away from a clear vision for what was going to happen at WrestleMania. I don't necessarily know that that was the way to go. Especially when all the alternatives to the guy that's being booed have been rejected by the company, whether they were Brock Lesnar or Dean Ambrose. Now, I understand that Roman Reigns and Triple H at WrestleMania is sort of the culmination of the story they've been telling all the way back to like October, November. But, at the same time, I don't know that the story's been told well enough to ultimately get the results that they wanted coming to WrestleMania 32. Now, another sort of area where they've been lacking is in this Shane McMahon match with The Undertaker inside Hell in the Cell for WrestleMania 32. Because I think the strongest point of everything that's been going on so far since Shane McMahon came back two weeks ago has been Shane McMahon on the mic. I don't know that Vince McMahon really sort of over the top playing it up has done too much to really set the stakes as being important for what's going on. There's just so much else that's getting lost in here with Vince McMahon uh, disowning his son and writing him out of his will when really all the focus it should be laser sighted should be on this idea that if Shane McMahon wins at WrestleMania 32 somehow inside Hell in the Cell with The Undertaker, he gets control of Monday Night Raw. And shit might change. And Shane McMahon, a really strong opening here on this week's Monday Night Raw, sort of alluded to that idea of guys who haven't necessarily been pushed prior, who haven't really gotten the breaks, who who have sort of suffered from a particular mindset towards their performance, may get their fair shot. And guys who have sort of been handed the world in a number of ways, will not. And I think that sort of teases a very interesting future, perspective future, for the WWE. And that it allows them to sort of address a number of problems they have with their storytelling and their booking by sort of rebooting on the fly through the conceit of the story they're telling. Because from there you can look at talent that the WWE Universe hasn't really gotten behind and who seem to sort of be stuck in a place because of how the company views them. Maybe somebody like a Ryback or a Big Show. And sort of flips things on their head and allows someone like a Bray Wyatt or Tyler Breeze or Dolph Ziggler to really get their shot and shine. But that really needs to be at the forefront of everything that's going on for that particular match. Nobody cares about Vince McMahon's inheritance or the fact that he's going to disown his own son. I know that they believe that in the sort of soap opera formula of the WWE that that sort of dramatic moment matters. But I don't believe it does anymore. What people really respond to is this idea 
that the power inside the WWE could change hands, theoretically, but manifest on screen in a way that changes how we view the product. That, I think, is what fans respond to. And that's what I think they need to continue to focus on. And it makes me wonder if there are great things in the future for some overlooked talent. Because Dolph Ziggler had sort of this interaction with Stephanie McMahon. Once again, hearkening back to the Survivor Series, where Dolph Ziggler put them single-handedly out of power by lasting and winning the match by himself. And once again, sort of piggybacked on Shane McMahon's sentiments. About maybe there is cause for hope for some talent on the WWE roster. Maybe there is cause for hope for some of the fans who feel like a number of talent don't get the respect and exposure and opportunity that others do. I don't know if Dolph Ziggler is being primed for something big after WrestleMania. It sort of feels like it. It really does. And I would hope... I would hope that they do. But once again, it's going to come down to the story that they're telling. But I believe that it would allow for a major shake-up to happen and a shake-up they desperately need that they can't just do on their own. They need a reason to sort of go forth with it and say, oh man, look at all these changes that are happening. But they need to maintain that focus, that those are really the stakes of this Shane McMahon versus Vince McMahon dynamic with The Undertaker inside Hell in a Cell WrestleMania involved. That's what they need to sort of stay, stick to on point. couple of really fantastic matches, though, this week. On Monday Night Raw. I mean, really fantastic. First, early on, you had Neville versus Kevin Owens. Now, Neville, who, if you've been exposed to him at uh, any length down in NXT, while his personality may not have really done that much for you, to watch him operate in the ring, I mean, he's something special. So have him go with Kevin Owens, who also is a master in the ring, is pretty outstanding. Really solid match. And the type of match that, especially in Chicago, which is where Monday Night Raw was, that crowd responds to. That is a smart, hardcore fan base there. Who, if they see really good in-ring product, love it. And they responded to that. And what you do is, even after a great match, you have Kevin Owens... Win by sort of a roll up and a pull of the tights, which just it makes him much more of a heel in the eyes of the fans. Something that they don't do enough of. And then there was sort of this awkward debut. A, a debut that I was somewhat excited about, but just the execution of it sort of rang a little bit hollow to me. Because Sami Zayn debuted on the main roster. In what looks like now a more permanent spot. And he came down and he saved Neville from being powerbombed onto the ring apron by Kevin Owens. Uh, a tactic that he, he used many times down in NXT to injure opponents. And we sort of had this throw down all out fist fight between Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Not only dealing with their long term history but just sort of their heated and hated rivalry that developed down in NXT. The problem is, 
that we sort of saw an interaction like that happen at the Royal Rumble in January. And guess what? There was no follow-up. There was no follow-up the next night on Raw. There was no follow-up in the subsequent weeks. So why is it that Sami Zayn only just sort of shows up now to unleash his fire on Kevin Owens? And then beyond that, this heated confrontation that really sort of kicks off the show following the Shane McMahon opening doesn't really get any follow-up on this particular show until the end when they're promoting a, a Miz TV segment on SmackDown. So this incredible moment that got the live audience super hot for what was happening never has another callback throughout the rest of the show. There's no backstage segment with Sami Zayn saying that he's here or even where he's, why he's here or for those people who may not watch NXT, where he came from or what his issue is with Kevin Owens. And I understand that you want to promote it for the next show, but to sort of have this hot moment happen and then just sort of dissipate, just sort of disappear into the abyss where no one talks about it again or brings up why it's important, I think is a missed opportunity. Now look, I'm excited about watching Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Don't get me wrong. I'd love to watch them go one-on-one, head-to-head. I don't know where we're going to get that at WrestleMania 32, but at some point I'm, I'm, I'm itching for it to happen. And I hope it's not just a raw thing they throw out there. I hope it's something that they continue to build. These two guys who hate each other, they're dying to get their hands on each other, but we're not going to let it happen yet. But I just thought it was a missed opportunity to sort of make this moment matter. And build on it. Because that's what they really need is build on the things that you do well. That's how you'd make go from good to great, from worse to better. Build on the things that people respond to. Instead of just sort of breezing through from segment to segment. Have some sort of connective tissue weave throughout the shows. To make people know that these things matter. And that they're not just, you know, segment one of our one. It was also a really fantastic tag team match between Y2AJ, a team that I absolutely loathe, uh, with the team of Chris Jericho and AJ Styles against The New Day. Fantastic back and forth match. Back and forth tag team match that we don't often see. Because here, once again, you had teams who were just absolutely refuse to lose tag team partners coming into the rings breaking up pins all the time doing whatever it is that they could pulling out all the stops to make sure that their side did not lose that's something that we often don't see often we see tag team partners still on the apron holding on to the tag rope hoping that their partner is going to be able to kick out but not actually going into the ring and being proactive and trying to stop anything from happening So the New Day retains, but a really fantastic match that, once again, the crowd responded to. I think they actually plowed through two commercial breaks, so it's like a three-segment match. And then on the other end, we get a Chris Jericho heel turn that I think also, once again, helped make AJ Styles as a credible babyface within the company. It took three code breakers to put him down. It allowed Chris Jericho, I think, to to go back to his strong suit right now, which is being a heel and not sort of a babyface trapped in 98 or 99 when I think he came up to WWE, probably right around the 2000 mark. And by having a solid foil to work against, it gives AJ Styles a really great opportunity to establish himself as a babyface within the WWE Universe because now they can have a heel that they hate which in turn gives them a babyface that they can love 
And too often, once again, this is a just a tried and true formula that the WWE just almost forgets about on many occasions. That if you want to get somebody over, you gotta put them with somebody who's over. And the best way to get a baby face over is to square them off against somebody that people loathe and hate. Not a cool heel. A heel that they despise. And right now, Chris Jericho is in the position to go there and help AJ Styles be established as a babyface within WWE. So kudos to that. I look, while I wasn't crazy, while I wasn't crazy about seeing these guys go back and forth for a number of months, because while I felt like their matches have been good so far, they haven't been able to take it next level, they haven't been great yet, Maybe if they're lining them up for a one-on-one -on -one at WrestleMania, maybe they've sort of worked a little of the rust off and they will be in a position to really do something special in Dallas. Other than that, not too much fantastic on Raw. I thought there were a couple of really strong segments. Uh, made it much more a, a better watch than I, I've seen in recent weeks. Uh, the, the Shane portion of the opening was good. Neville and Owens is fantastic. Wide 2 AJ versus The New Day is fantastic. There's a really good solid Ambrose promo. There's a really good Ziggler promo. Everything else is sort of just even keel, but there's some stuff. The, the, the good for me, I, I didn't think there was anything really bad on the show. There's stuff that's just sort of okay. Nothing really bad on the show, but there are some good things on the show. And for that, I thought this week's Raw was actually pretty solid. So with that, let me talk about uh, Roadblock coming up this Saturday, the matches that have been announced, make some predictions as we head through that, and then on the way to WrestleMania once again. Uh, the main event of Triple H versus Dean Ambrose. Uh, as much as I would love Dean Ambrose to have the belt and sort of shake things up heading into WrestleMania, I just don't see it happening. I think he's pretty well set up into his feud with Brock Lesnar. And for that, once again, uh, it is a roadblock, just sort of a detour as we once again are on the road to WrestleMania. Uh, so for that, I see Triple H retaining and maybe a uh, Roman Reigns return. Um, and we'll see how that goes over because I think that will be a real barometer for how Reigns is received as we head in the final weeks towards WrestleMania. Brock Lesnar versus Bray Wyatt. Um, this is one of those weird things that happen on Raw, which is that they finally touched upon the fact that Bray Wyatt and the Wyatt family all illegally went and deprived Brock Lesnar of a chance to headline WrestleMania by eliminating him from the Royal Rumble. This is something that happened at the end of January, and no one has said boo about in the following weeks. As if we were going to forget. So when they call it back out of convenience, it's just odd. It's like, are you not even watching the programming, the product that you create? So, I like Lesnar in this match. I think we'll get some Wyatt interference, but I think there's going to be lots of suplexes dished out. The New Day versus Sheamus and uh, King Wade Bad News Barrett. Um... You know, the New Day's been trying to drum up something against the League of Nations, uh, who I still don't believe anyone cares about. So, um, look, uh, the belt, they're going to keep the belts on the New Day. I think they're holding on <coughs> excuse me, to those belts until post-WrestleMania, which I see a new tag team coming up from NXT and maybe stealing those belts from them, much in the way that Paige sort of put herself on the map post-WrestleMania. So for that, I see the New Day holding on for right now uh, as they think they're, they're going to drop them later down the line at a time that it actually benefits somebody to go over them and, uh, and will go a long way to sort of establishing another tag team uh, coming up as new tag team champions. So for that, I'm picking the New Day. And also an NXT match on the card with the revival of Dash and Dawson putting their NXT Tag Team Champions Championships on the line against Enzo and Big Kaz. I think Enzo and Big Kaz is the tag team to make the leap post WrestleMania. They may be the team that takes out the New Day, but I think here here's a real shot for them to sort of put NXT on the map with people tuning into the WWE Network who may not normally follow NXT. Dash and Dawson are an amazing tag team. I love the hell out of them, and I look forward to watching this match. I think they're going to go hold on because I think there's bigger things in the future for Enzo and Big Cass. This is sort of just a way to sort of square the rivalry and 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 
and sort of put it to an end. Um, but I think that there's big things in the future for both of these tag teams. But right now, I think Dash and Dawson, they're going to make the most out of this opportunity. Um, I almost watched TNA this week. Almost. I, get, I, did, I have revived my cable. I do have cable once again, so sort of I can follow Raw regularly on Monday nights when I'm out of the house. And last night, flipping around, I almost watched TNA. I also almost set a DVR for it um, on, on Pop TV. I was like, oh, look, Impact Wrestling is on. And I was really tempted to go there. I didn't. I didn't. But um, look, TNA, you almost got me to. So let's just say, uh, let's call that progress. Okay, let's call that progress. Um, and the other thing that I did this week is I actually... After, after talking with Tom Nix last week on uh, Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 25, I went out of my way, I dropped some money on uh, iTunes, and I picked up season one of Lucha Underground. Now, I only have watched the first few episodes in order to get started. The takeaways that I can get right out of the way, it is a different and interesting program to watch. Uh, the way it is shot is somewhat distracting, uh, particularly for those first couple episodes. I'm hoping it sort of settles into a nice groove, but visually, a lot of cuts, a lot of edit. Somebody needs to just get that editor to calm the fuck down uh, here and there and hold some of the shots a little bit longer because the number of cuts, uh, it's dizzying, like Michael Bay dizzying. So I hope they can sort of settle into a groove there. And the other takeaway is that Prince Puma is an absolute magician to watch in the ring. I love watching that guy step between the ropes and into the squared circle. And I look forward to progressing further with Lucha Underground, um, and uh, as I as I sort of get a, a better feel for how it is, but at least right now, um, while I'm not totally into it yet, I do see the appeal. It is a nice alternative, and uh, I hope that it can continue to grab me a little bit further uh, as I continue to progress into the show. Uh, so, with all of that said, that's really it for this particular episode. I want to thank you guys for listening as I flew solo and put some things out on the table for you to think about as we head through Roadblock this week and beyond as we go towards WrestleMania 32 in Dallas. Make sure you follow all of our social media pages. Uh, Hit us up on Twitter at JTW Podcast. That's the official Twitter handle of Just the Worst Podcast. At Tis Infamous, uh, which is the official Twitter handle of This Is Infamous, which is our home mothership. And make sure you follow me on Twitter at InfamousKid, two Ds at the end right there, K-I-D-D, for all of my random ramblings and musings throughout the day on any given day. So make sure you follow all those. Over on Facebook, facebook.com slash Just The Worst Podcast, facebook.com slash Tis Infamous, and facebook.com slash Billy The Kid. Work through those Facebook algorithms. They're a pain in the ass and they limit your content. But if you continue to hit up those pages, you'll see all of our notifications. So just do your best to work through them. Uh, But make sure that you like and follow all of those particular Facebook pages. Podcast can be found at soundcloud.com. That's soundcloud.com slash just the worst podcast. Also, if you have a mobile device, download the SoundCloud app. This way, once you set up your subscription, you can have all the shows in all of their episodes, every single podcast that we create and broadcast and publish and put out there in the world, you can have on your mobile device, on your tablet, and wherever it is that you have a device with the SoundCloud app on, you can bring me and all of our shows with you. So make sure that you have that, soundcloud.com slash just the worst podcast or the SoundCloud app. You can find my work regularly at joeblow.com. This is Infamous, or right here at Just the Worst Podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Billy Donnelly. This has been Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 26. Make sure you hit those ropes hard and kick out before the count of three, because those are the rules. I'll be back next week, post-roadblock, as we sort of break that show down. Uh, But in the meantime, you have yourself a pleasant, immediate future. I'm out for now. Peace. Just the Worst Wrestling Podcast, episode number 26, has been a presentation of Just the Worst Podcast Media 